Hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Ruggiano, and in 1988, I was struggling with addiction, and I went into a treatment center. I set up a helpline number, which is 855-963-2113. That's 855-963-2113. That number, phones will be manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you're struggling with addiction, or you know someone that is struggling with addiction, please call that number and let me help. I will be hands-on. I will be personally involved in the person's recovery. They will meet me. They will spend time with me. And I will help them live a life beyond their wildest dreams. So please, if you know anybody that has a problem with addiction or you yourself have a problem with addiction, please call that number and let me help. And also help their family members or friends. Please call that number, 855-963-2113. That's 855-963. 9632113 Welcome to Reform Gangsters. My name is Anthony Reggiano. If you like my content, please click the like button, hit subscribe and ring that bell. If you really enjoy what I'm doing, become a member and of reformgangsters.com and you get early access to my content and you can ask me questions live on the show. This month viewers poll is sponsored by readergiganti.net who is the daughter of Vincent the Chin Giganti. And to book a psychic reading with the Chin's daughter, Rita Giganti, go to her website, readergiganti.net. She also has an amazing book you can get on the site called The Godfather's Daughter. I highly recommend it. So this week's viewer, viewer poll was, who is the most responsible for the fall of the mafia? I received 1,600 votes. Um, Sammy had 9%. John Gotti was 30% at fault. Rudy Giuliani was 53%. And the other 8% was uh, Rico, Joe Banana, and his book. My opinion which I'm going to throw in there when I look at this viewer poll, is that the fall of the mafia had to do with the RICO status. When the RICO status was implemented by the government, after the first test case, which was Funds of Wild, he was the, he was the boss of um, the Genovese family at the time, I believe, or a high-ranking member of the Genovese family. I remember after he got convicted, my father was sitting in the kitchen of my house reading the front page article about his case and he pushed the newspaper over to me and he said that it's all over for us. After that conversation, my father and I went to prison the rest of our lives and John Gotti died in prison over the RICO status. Sammy DeBu went to prison and cooperated over the RICO status. So as far as individuals go, they brought light on us and the government, through that light, the government was able to investigate us and charge us with RICOs because they brought heat to us by their lifestyle. That's just my opinion. And that's an opinion of someone that lived that life. I mean, I know a lot of people that vote on stuff like that are people that are that were in the life, which is fine. You know, they read, they, they, they're they educated people. They know what's going on. But my opinion is, um, the RICO status was the was the was the was the what killed the mob. You know, I got indicted personally for state RICOs. I, matter of fact, I was a test case in New York State. I was charged with the first state RICO, which was called ARCA. It was a different. It was a RICO, but it was under the state law. It was called ARCA, a state RICO for bookmaking in the Queens uh, DA's office, the Organized Crime Task Force. The New York State Organized Crime Task Force um, indicted me, and how that happened was I got arrested 
in the December of 90 in the street, in the, in the, in the, in the policy office, which is now the lottery. And uh, we got out on bail and we went right back into the street to work again. And in March of the next year of 91, I got re-indicted for a state RICO because we went back and continued the enterprise. Today's member questions are from Bart. Let's say Neil was boss. Who does he name as underboss and counselieri? At the time of Carlo Gambino's death, if Paul didn't become the boss and our Neil did at that point in time, who would Neil name as underboss? I don't know. That's a good question. I know. I think as far as Councilor is concerned, it would have been um, Joe Gallo, the guy that was already Councilor that 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 Paul kept and so did John keep as the counselor for a while. That's who do I think would have been came the underboss? Um, I think it would have either been between three people. I think it would have either been between John Gotti, an old timer, one of the old time captains, maybe like a Joe Piney, or actually maybe Paul Castellano, just to keep the peace with the Sicilian fraction. Hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Ruggiano, and in 1988, I was struggling with addiction, and I went into a treatment center. I set up a helpline number, which is 855-963-2113. That's 855-963-2113. That number, phones will be manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you're struggling with addiction, or you know someone that is struggling with addiction, please call that number and let me help. I will be hands-on. I will be personally involved in the person's recovery. They will meet me. They will spend time with me. And I will help them live a life beyond their wildest dreams. So please, if you know anybody that has a problem with addiction or you yourself have a problem with addiction, please call that number and let me help. And also help their family members or friends. Please call that number, 855-963-2113. That's 855-963. 963-2113. Chris's question is, were there factions inside the Gambinos that detested John killing Paul? I'm sure there was. I don't think the Sicilians in Brooklyn were too happy about that, but they weren't going to voice their, their, their um, displeasure because let's be real, you know, they were scared to get killed. At that point, it was a, it was a hostile takeover. I mean, it was, you know, and people got to understand it's, it's like the Senate. I mean, when Paul got killed, all the captains had to meet and vote on who was going to become the boss and people had to nominate other captains. I actually think Sammy nominated John or Frankie DeChico. It might've been Sammy who nominated. So now, so now you got to picture this. Here's all the captains of the Gabino family in a room after Paul's demise, and they're in a room, and everybody knows what happened, but a lot of them are making out they don't know what happened because not all of them were in on that. You know, only a small amount of the captains were in on that. So out of 20-something captains, whatever there is, they didn't all know what was jumping off because some of them would have warned Paul. So it was very few people that knew it was jumping off. So now here we are in a room full of captains and someone nominates Sean as the boss and it has to be a unanimous decision. So at that point, it was like, well, if I don't nominate this guy, they're going to kill, they're going to kill me. So they all vote, you know what I mean? So, so they all voted for John, you know? And now once John is voted on and he's the boss and it's official, now it's a dictatorship. At one point, he had a sit down with all the captains and he told them, you know, I could take you all down right now, right? And none of you, you know, like knock them down to just back to soldiers, take their stripes away. And they said, yeah, you know, and actually he didn't, but he could have. You could say it was a hostile takeover. I mean, so whoever wasn't happy with that, and I'm sure there were a couple of captains and a lot of you know, made members that were not happy about what happened because it was against the rules and it was a hostile takeover. 
and not everybody liked John. I mean, I liked him. <laughs> I mean, uh, so yeah, so definitely there was people that that weren't happy with it, but they uh, they kept their mouth shut. I mean, the other families didn't. Uh, we know that, like the Lucchese's and the Genovese's, they um, retaliated. You know, they retaliated by trying to kill John himself. I mean, John was warned by the FBI uh, that the, that the Genovese had a contract out on him. They they the, they were plotting to kill Nicky Carraza. He was a powerful captain. He was he was my guy, Nicky. He was my co-defendant in Florida. I went to prison with him. Um, they killed Bobby Burriello, who was John's bodyguard, who was John Jr.'s best man at his wedding. Like I said on another podcast, they killed my good friend Eddie Lino, who I you know knew from the '70s, who I worked with in the number business. We used to go to Yankee games together, me, him, and this guy, Charlie Wingy, who was his partner, and this guy, Jimmy Balls, the three of them were partners. We used to go to the Yankee games together, they were, and they killed uh, Frankie DeChico, who was another friend of mine, you know, that, that I knew pretty good. You know, they blew him up. So, you know, there was retaliation. Not, the people were, weren't happy. Um, did we, did mobsters have New Year's resolutions? I don't know. I never had, we never had New Year's resolutions, but it's funny because, um, my whole life, even when, you know, when I was a little child, my parents always went out on New Year's Eve, but my father always had my whole life private parties on New Year's Eve because he used to call New Year's Eve amateur night because all the amateurs are out there drinking. So he would never go to a place or club anywhere else. But So he always had private parties in bars he owned or bars he had a... Uh, um, the owners wore him like he was, you know, he was the silent partner, more or less, let's say, <laughs> you know, one way or the other. And uh, so he would go and I would stay with my grandparents every New Year's Eve when I was a child with my brother and my sister. And we would, you know, my grandmother would bang pots outside the house at 12 o'clock. But uh, when I got older and I started hanging out with my father, then I started going to his New Year's Eve parties. And we always had a big, it was funny because we he always had a big party and and all his, his whole crew came with their wives and their girlfriends. And he always had a big party with food, a lot of drinking, a lot of 12 o'clock, everybody be kissing each other and everything. And it's funny because after 12, all the guys would stop bringing their wives and girlfriends home and then they would come back by themselves. And then at five in the morning, there'd be like a hundred guys in the bar drinking till like the next afternoon. And that's just went on every New Year's Eve. Uh, we used to go to the Raven night, of course, in the day, you know, that was, just like Christmas Eve, we would go to the Cafe Liberty and then we would go to the Raven night and wish everybody, you know, on Neil and everybody a happy new year and everything. And then we would go from the Raven night, we would go to wherever my father was having his private party. And then we would stay there basically till the next day, practically. So we always partied on and celebrated New Year's Eve privately. But as far as resolutions, we never, you know, we never had resolutions. We were like, I have some other stuff here to talk about. I want to thank everybody for their support. Of course, uh, we have a lot of fun stuff coming up next year in 2023. I think it's going to be a good year. You know, keep going, logging on to my to my websites, reformgangsters.com, anthonyrugianojr.com. We'll put all the information out on that. We're going to go back to the track. We're going to go back to Aqueduct Racetrack and Belmont Racetrack. I spent a lot of days in those two places. Back in the day, you know, a lot of wise guys used to go there. A lot of mobsters used to go there. I mean, some of them, I mean, every day. I mean, you go there every day and there was captains and soldiers there and bosses until, you know, it was it was a different kind of um, atmosphere than it is today, the racetrack. The racetrack back then, you know, in the 70s, for me in the 70s and even into the 80s, it was uh, always crowded, always a lot of action. A lot of deals went down in there. It was like a meeting space spot during the day for the mob you know a lot of people were there i'm trying to plan a reform gangsters poker tournament for february i'll have more information on that on my websites and uh, i'm going to do some more events with rita giganti which was a lot of fun the first one uh, you know she talks to dead people which is cool you know if you want know anybody you want to try to reach you know come on you know to the event and rita might hook you up with them and, uh, and of course, I'm writing my story. I'm uh, pu we're putting together a script. And also, don't forget my recovery helpline. If you know anybody that has a addiction problems, uh, I have a, a helpline, uh, which we 
advertise on the beginning of my, my podcast. Uh, it's a recovery phone number, recovery helpline, 855-963-2113. You know, call that number. Someone's going to be there uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, you know, and let us uh, help you, you know. Um, so uh, call the number if you need help.